Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'm Amanda, I'm part of the Transportation Alliance Communications team. Thanks for joining our discussion on protecting your drivers and protecting your passengers. We'd like to thank our presenter, Jeb Corey, for joining us and bringing this discussion uh, for us. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, you can join the conversation anytime by unmuting yourself or by using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We also encourage you to turn on your camera to join the discussion. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to submit them on the chat feature and we will get to those uh, at the end of the discussion. Um, Finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be hosted on the Ride Local Massachusetts website, which is ridelocalma.com. With that, a warm welcome to Jeb, and I will hand it over to you, Jeb, to start our discussion. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Just want to always want to make sure when I start these things out, you can hear me clearly, correct? Okay, and you can see me, right? I did one of these one yes. time you couldn't <laughs> see me, and I had to get like called out about it. So, all right, so we're off from the moment here. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. Give me just a second to get set up. Got it up there. Hopefully you guys can see that pretty well. Uh, so today's webinar is really focusing on passenger and driver safety. Um, let's see. Make sure I can click through this. There we go. So a little bit about me. So I've been in the transportation business for about 20 years now, and uh, we've got a small fleet, about 25, 30 vehicles in Charleston, West Virginia. And we use those vehicles for a lot of different things. It's traditional taxi business. We do corporate accounts. We do crew transportation. We do a lot of non-emergency medical transportation. We do a little bit of ride share in there as well. And we've always really been, had a huge focus on technology. Anytime we can include technology that really makes a good value for us, we try to do that. So a little bit of overview on today, what we're talking about with the safety is that, you know, it's, it's really an important aspect of every department of your business uh, or organization, but really we're gonna focus kind of on drivers, passengers, and vehicles. Uh, also with safety, I mean, it's a topic that's so vast that it's, it's almost impossible to really go over every single detail in a single presentation. So the goal of today is really provide a general overview of uh, you know, several safety areas and hope that it spurs some ideas, improvements, or possible practices that you can include in your own safety environment. Um, and it, with, with any business, it's always important to, to really find balance with you know, what's effective, right? So there might be several factors involved um, that, that really play a role there. It could be the size of your transportation organization. The jurisdiction you're in can control a lot of what you can and cannot do. Um, and then obviously the cost of some of this stuff, all this stuff can become extremely expensive as well. So you always want to kind of try to find a good balance between what works well for you and, and, and what can be afforded and, and things of that nature. And also if there are any topics, processes, or technology that you want more information on that I did not uh, include in this presentation, you know, just let us know later by email and I'll be more than happy to follow up with uh, anybody on anything they'd like to know more about. Uh, so a lot of times with um, safety, the greatest place to start really is going to be at the driver. And anytime you have a prospective driver that you want to onboard, right off the bat, you know, you can do some really good things to make sure that you're putting a qualified driver behind the wheel of a vehicle. Obviously, criminal background checks are great, right? Because you're going to be able to go back and see the history uh, of, of, of an individual. And criminal background checks can be done a lot of different ways. You can do federal fingerprint background checks. You can do it at the state level. You can do a social security address check. And that's kind of pretty good sometimes because it'll go back and look at the um, addresses of where an individual has lived over a period of time. And everywhere they've lived, they, it'll check the county court records. Um, and then a lot of times a mix of all those is really helpful because sometimes courthouses don't report things to the states and feds and the feds may not report things to the state and courthouses. So you may even want to do a mixture of all three to be on the safest end. Some jurisdictions have great access to federal fingerprint background checks. They're relatively inexpensive, they're fast, they're extremely comprehensive. You know, anytime you can do that, that's definitely the way to go. Um, and sometimes you might want to stagger them, right? So maybe you could just do the, maybe you start with the federal fingerprint background check, and then a year later, you do the state background check, and then a year later, you do the Social Security County Courthouse check. And that gives you multiple checks over years, and you're, so you're doing some continuous checking, and you're getting it from different sources. Um, so those are things to consider with doing the, 
the criminal background check. Obviously, you want to do a motor vehicle uh, record check as well because these people are going to be driving, right? So you're going to want to see what their driving record is over a period of time. And those are generally easy to pull, or sometimes you can have a driver get themselves and pull it in and bring it into the office for you to see. And you're going to want to check that because that's going to tell you, you know, how have they been running red lights or stop signs? Do they have points on their license and things of that nature. So you're always going to want to check and make sure that you're, the person, again, that you're going to onboard here uh, has a clean motor vehicle uh, record. Uh, drug screening is another important thing to consider, right? So especially if you're doing a lot of contract work, sometimes those contracts are going to require some type of drug screening. So having a good process for that works pretty well. Um, you, there's, and again, there's lots of platforms for that. Some of these platforms you can really do all these things in, right? You can be a central portal you go to and uh, it can be automating a onboarding of a person and they can set up a background check. They can go ahead and get the motor vehicle check for you and they can set up a drug screening uh, generally at a third party office near your location. Obviously, another thing you want to do is make sure that the driver actually has experience. Um, you know, some people may have a, uh, a driver's license um, that they've had for 10 years, but they haven't really been driving a lot. Or maybe they're 25, 30, 35 years old, but they just got their driver's license a year ago or something like that. So as much as you can, you want to kind of look to see what kind of driving experience that person has. Again, check the length of time that they've had a license and maybe the length of time that they've been driving. Uh, and then obviously when you're onboarding a driver, it's a great time to check the communication skills, right? So really a huge part of driving is customer service. And these people are gonna be dealing with all kinds of people all the time. So this is a good opportunity for you to see what kind of communication skills they have, because in the long run with safety, a lot of that comes back to how a person communicates. Implementation. <laughs> So this generally becomes one of the most important parts of any type of safety program. You can have all types of different practices, all types of different procedures, all types of different technology, but if you don't implement it properly, it becomes useless. So you wanna make sure that you find different ways to implement your different procedures, information, education, so that the people are actually grasping it. Uh, safety orientation classes are some of the best ways to do that. Again, you want these people in person. You want to you know, meet them in real life, see who they are, see how they talk, see how they act, watch their nonverbal communication skills. That's a huge uh, benefit right off the bat. You have like in-office display screens. So, you know, sometimes you've got, uh, you want to look again at con continuous education or continuous information. Sometimes it can be difficult to meet with every single person all the time when things change. So if you have drivers or a facility where the drivers are coming in and out of the office a lot, then an in-office display screen uh, can work very well. And just think of that kind of like a uh, when you go to a fast food restaurant and they have the menu up on a, on a digital billboard or something like that, that's kind of what you're going to look at. Although it's going to have safety tips on it that kind of show you or tell you what's, what's going on or new safety practices and things of that nature. Um, social media pages are another great place to share information. Uh, specific online portals we'll talk about here in a little bit, newsletters, email blasts, and text blasts. These are all ways you can continuously communicate uh, with drivers uh, over time. And, and, and obviously, the more continuous uh, education you can give, the safer those drivers are going to be. So in-person orientation meetings, you know, we've already talked a little bit about that. But, you know, and this is going to happen during the onboarding process. Uh, this is a great place to discuss safety practices while the driver is new and attentive, right? So when you're onboarding a driver, usually that's when they're paying attention. This is this may or may not be a relatively new job for them, but a lot of times it is. And when somebody's new to something, that's when you have most of their attention. You've got their focus. It's a good time to really go over safety practices with them because they are paying attention. Also, again, it allows you to observe the driver and their communication skills. Uh, and it gives you the opportunity to show them any safety or operational videos you have. So if you have other uh, safety programs that you're going to do, like the, the past CTAA, past training, or NIMTAC training, or any other type of training that's out there, while you've got them there in person, it's a good time to kind of set them up and go over that with them. And also, again, you can observe them. So if they're not paying attention, that could be a very big red flag. Uh, I had a great opportunity to be at um, Tom Riggi's open house uh, last week up in the Boston area, and he actually has a, a safety coordinator that does all their training and orientation, and she calls herself the safety goddess, and it's brilliant because she's almost like a stand-up comedian at the same time she's giving all the information. So the whole time, you're paying attention because, one, 
she's hysterical and funny and so that, that has your attention and two if you doze off or aren't paying attention she's going to call you out on it and make sure you are paying attention um, so having a good personality to make sure people pay attention can also be very important while you have people at the office another great tool can be a ride along slash drive along and this could be for new or potential drivers um, with, with you, which, which you're gonna kinda wanna do is stick them with maybe a more experienced person. And this could be a lot of different people in your organization. It could be yourself, it could be a safety manager, uh, it could be a driver that's been with you for a long time that you can kind of really trust and go over things. And this allows you to put the person in the vehicle and they can see in real time, in real life, how this job works. And you know things you're going to want to go over are the dispatch system. If you have any type of emergency alert functions, um, how the voice communications work. If you utilize an in-vehicle camera system, how that works. And again, it allows you to watch, uh, if you, especially when you switch roles and you allow the new onboarding person to kind of drive. It allows you to kind of watch how that person operates everything. So again, it's another good opportunity to kind of really observe how somebody's going to be in the presence of other people. Obviously, they may be on a little bit better, uh, um, giving you the better light of themselves because you're in the vehicle with them, but still it's a good idea to do it. Also, what's really interesting about this is there can be parts of town, I know sometimes in our area, there can be dangerous intersections, right? For whatever reason, maybe there's blind spots or other types of traffic issues. This can be a good time to really point those things out because you're actually driving through the city. You can say, hey, look, this intersection, you always have to be careful at because you've got a blind turn here or something of that nature. Uh, let's see, role playing. Okay, this is another fantastic, very fantastic thing that you can do in person. And uh, what I always suggest is kind of coming up with your most common complaints or issues. Um, some scenarios might be an upset passenger because the, the driver's late, or there's always arguments over fare costs or not helping with bags or luggage, or how the driver is driving or heating, cooling, choice of music. Again, as a driver, you, you're in customer service and you want to make sure that passenger who's your customer is always taken care of the best as possible. So you should always be helping them with bags or luggage or, you know, correcting driving or ask them, do you like music or not music? Do you want air conditioning or you want the windows down? Or what do you like? And, and as long as you kind of set the stage or expectations, a lot of that goes away. But sometimes people don't really kind of realize all that stuff. And passengers can be, you know, they can, they can kind of be difficult sometimes. So we have found that if you can create these scenarios and, and do a role playing, it's a great way to kind of educate the driver on how to deal with them. Because now you can kind of go through it real time with them. You can show them, you know, sometimes these scenarios can get go this way or get this bad. And so role playing becomes a very effective in person tool uh, for training for customer service and safety. And again, this plays so close to safety because you know, a lot of times what happens is arguments, right? If they're not de escalated, they can escalate. And when they escalate, they turn into, they go from arguments to violence or anything like that. And that becomes a huge problem. So you always want to make sure that you can kind of role play these issues out to be de-escalated, not escalated. Email and text are great as well. So, you know, we've talked a lot about a lot of in-person stuff, but these people, you know, that you're onboarding, they're going to become drivers. So they're going to be out in the field per se a lot. And they're always going to be in the office and new stuff is going to come up and new stuff is going to be uh, communicated to them. So when that happens, you gotta have good effective ways of doing that. You know, if they're in the office, you can talk to them. If you have the screen up uh, in your office, they can watch it, but email and text become very uh, good tools for getting across information. Email generally allows for a lot more information. So you can send an email out. It can be multiple paragraphs long. It can include links to videos. It can include attachments. Uh, it could be a newsletter that you send out. Um, Email is generally good for longer stuff. Well, text is generally good for shorter stuff, right? You're just trying to get something quick across. Now, text messages come a long way too. So even though you're limited on characters, you can also kind of include attachments or infographics or links to bigger documents within a text. At our operation, we have found that we've got a lot more people that actually open texts or view text messages than they do for emails. There's lots of different programs out there. We use MailChimp for email, but there's a lot of different things. If you kind of just Google these things, you'll see them. Uh, we use simple texting for texting. Uh, that's a great tool that we utilize. Zip Whip, I know a lot of operators out there use it. That can also be a great tool for texting. 
And the great thing about using these programs that are dedicated to that stuff is they offer a lot of statistics. So if you just create a, an email blast within your own email program, it might get the emails out, but you might not get a lot of statistics for it. Um, so both emailing and texting platforms now can tell you an open rate if, if it gets bounced, how often it's opened, who opened it, how long did they look at it. And so these dedicated platforms are extremely useful and showing you uh, those things, giving you detailed statistics. And again, this is going to be safety stuff. A lot of times you can send out. So if uh, you know, you've know you got a new little safety procedure that you want to go out, if something has changed, it's not working, and you need to send it out, email and text is a great way to do it now. Uh, central portals. So one thing that uh, we're really seeing is the creation of a central place where uh, everybody can kind of go and see things at your operation, right? It could be your managers, it could be the drivers, it could be the mechanics, it could be all kinds of different people. And this could be just something like a private group on Facebook um, that allows a con an administrator to control who's in and out of the group. Um, there's other private, more secure portals, Yammer, Slack, Asana, Happio are all some examples of them. Again, there's tons of these out there. Uh, some of these platforms do charge a flat group rate so maybe it's just a flat fee per month or maybe they charge per individual but when you have when you pay for a central portal like that you usually get a lot more functionality and some dispatch systems these days are even kind of having some basic portal functionality to them and so when we take this back to safety this is a great place where you can again put up safety videos right or links to safety articles or upload newsletters and it's a place where a driver doesn't have to come back to the office necessarily all the time to review it. So when they're not driving or they're you know, grabbing breakfast or before their day starts or things of that nature, a, a central portal is a great place for them to kind of go and get the latest up-to-date up information. So gamification. So one of the things that you're always going to find is complacency. And that's almost one of the biggest enemies of trying to continuously educate uh, anybody on anything, but safety included. And what happens is, is people get, you get complacent over time. It happens to everybody, it happens to me. I'll catch myself doing it sometimes, right? You start getting into a practice of doing the same thing all the time and you get used to it and you just think you kind of, you get comfortable. And sometimes you kind of just don't pay attention to it anymore, right? You stop reading the emails, or you stop reading the text messages, or you're not checking the central portal, or you don't come into the office and watch the screen. So sometimes you need to kind of make it a, you need to find ways they pay attention to the stuff that you're actually sending out there. So gamification allows you to create contests or points or things of that nature and make it a little bit more entertaining for the user or consumer of your media to pay attention to things. So maybe you set up a point program for, you know, if they read the newsletter or the, or the safety article and they answer a couple questions on a quiz for it and that reports back to you and you can see who, do that, who did that. And maybe over time you track those points and you create levels, right? So you have silver, gold, and platinum, for instance, and you have little lever, levels of drivers can reach. And then maybe you also reward them for those points. Maybe they earn certain points and they can trade them in and it gets them you know, so maybe a hat or a t-shirt, or if you lease to drivers, a discount on the lease or something like that. But if you gamify something and give it a, another goal for them to reach or make it something more entertaining, then a lot of times you get some more participation in, in what that content may be and how it's utilized. So defensive driving is obviously another huge place uh, for, for a driving job. And in my mind, defensive driving really entails being aware or mindful of your surroundings and knowing how to handle different scenarios in an effort to avoid an accident or situation that may result in an accident. So when you talk about defensive driving, some good things to go over uh, with potential drivers is being self-aware. Start with themselves, right? You, they should know how they handle situations, the types of scenarios they're good at and not at. Sometimes drivers are not great night drivers, right? You, obviously, you need to be self-aware of that, and you should not be driving at night. And you should also you know, make sure you put yourself in a position where you don't get stuck out there at night. Or if you're not so great at driving in the snow, these are things to know about yourself so that you can adjust it and make sure you're in a comfortable scenario. And also, when you're self-aware, you you've got to be mindful of you know, what you're doing. So if you're in a car and you're just scatterbrained and not thinking about anything, 
um, that you should be at that point in time, such as driving the vehicle, if you're put to playing on your cell phone or being distracted by other things, now obviously that's gonna lead to a lot of problems. Now, not only do you need to be self-aware, but you have to be aware of other drivers, right? Because that's a lot of safety problems happens, occurs when other drivers aren't driving the greatest or other drivers aren't paying attention or other drivers aren't self-aware. And, and when that happens, that can cause an accident. And you wanna avoid that as much as possible. So you have to pay attention to how other drivers are driving. If you are scanning your environment and watching traffic signs and things like that, and watching how other drivers, are they slowing down towards the yellow light? Are they speeding up? You know, is a driver, another driver near you weaving in and out of traffic? Should you kind of back up some so that you can remove yourself from a potential situation? These are all, uh, you know, scenarios you kind of want to go over with potential drivers so they understand the conditions that they're going to be in. Which brings us to our third point is know your environmental conditions. So you got to be self-aware, you're self-aware of other drivers, and you want to be so aware of the environment, right? You know, and this this can be tricky. I, sometimes people, again, they, they become complacent and they think this is common sense. But sometimes if you take a uh, you know a driver from the, the south, maybe from Atlanta, Georgia, for instance, and they move up to New England or the Boston area where there's lots of snow and they start getting out there and they don't really know how to drive so much snow because they don't have that experience, that can be a problem. So you always want to make sure that you go over certain environmental conditions that could be dangerous so drivers understand those slow down in the rain, slow down in the snow, slow down in these types of things. And this can play a role with those ways of communicating that we talked about earlier. So if you, if, if you do have a huge snowstorm coming up or a huge torrential rain pour, you can send out a little text blast to people that says, hey, we've got some bad weather out and we're going to slow down and, and pay, pay attention. So communication. And communication can be one of the most important ways of of staying out of danger, of not getting into a problem. And I talked a little bit about this earlier, about de-escalating the situation. And in this um, industry, de-escalating situation is, is premier on top of so many different things. It's, it's hugely important to be able to do. And you'll see this happen all the time and people just get caught up. And it can be tough. It can be stressful out there as a driver, right? You got people yelling at you all the time. You're in traffic. You know, you're just having a bad day, weather puts you behind, a lot of stressful factors can build up. And then sometimes what happens is, you know, you, you've got that stress going on and you pick up a passenger and they start adding to it and you kind of, you know, have a problem or have an issue and you want to be able to de-escalate that situation. So when someone's yelling at you, you don't want a driver who yells back. You want a driver who says, you know what, I apologize. You know, this is what happened. We got stuck behind traffic. And the more you can de-escalate a situation and not have a problem, the better off you're going to be. And I try to use this technique all the time in, in, in almost everything I do, personal life, if I'm talking to other employees, or sometimes I get frustrated too, and I just want to yell and scream. And I just take a deep breath and I say, you know what? I just kind of calm down and then I attempt to de-escalate the situation so that we don't have a bigger issue or, or, or we're not creating a negative atmosphere per se. So technology, when it comes to technology, there are all kinds of different things out there these days that can keep drivers, passengers, and the public safe. Some of the things we're going to discuss here are electronic dispatch systems, GPS, voice communications, in-vehicle camera systems, maintenance software, and some, new, some of the newer vehicle systems that you're seeing hit the market. Uh, electronic dispatch systems. So these have actually been around for decades. And in my opinion, it wasn't really until the advancements of good mobile device technology like smartphones and tablets that they really hit a sweet spot. Uh, when you can take a powerful smartphone or a tablet and connect it to the internet, the dispatch software, these are really becoming the multi-tool of transportation organizations. And the systems can really help create a safer environment uh, in several different ways. Um, GPS is usually a huge part of any dispatch system, right? Because you got to know kind of where the car is to do any type of dispatching. And it can be built into uh, a mobile device like cell phone or tablet. Um, it can be standalone hardware that's in the vehicle. Uh, it can make it really so uh, drivers can be located in an emergency, right? It's not just about dispatching a trip to a driver, but if a driver has a problem, that you know where their location is. And some of these you know, dispatch systems also have a, um, either a hardware button or a, uh, a 
a tap system on the screen. So you double tap or something you can do on the screen that will send an emergency alert back to the office. So if they're having an issue, they can kind of let the office know quietly without maybe letting the passenger know that's the problem and that you can kind of really see where the driver is at that time. And that can help you get authorities there without you know, letting somebody else know that there's an issue, such as maybe a passenger in the car. Some other neat things you can do, you can kind of set up geofences to see where drivers enter in certain areas as well. So if you, there's an area of a town that maybe there's, again, you have constant traffic accidents on or other types of issues, you know, the system can let you know when you have vehicles in that area and maybe pay closer attention. Uh, voice communication. So back in the 80s, 90s, uh, early O's, you know, a lot of our dispatching was done by radio communication. And as, as some of these digital dispatch systems have come on board, uh, most of it has kind of gone electronic, right? You don't necessarily hear voices as much. Uh, we still use some voice communication here. Um, keep in mind earlier, like I said, that tablet's become multi-tool, right? It's your GPS, it's your dispatch. It can do a lot of different things. And on ours, we implement a push to talk app on it. And that's what it's similar to the older radios. You know, you just kind of tap on the tablet in a certain place and it opens up a voice channel between the driver and the dispatcher. And that could come in, 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 in very lot of handy, especially when drivers kind of get into some situations where they need a little bit more than just maybe texting back and forth or they can't really pull out their cell phone and call you. Uh, a lot of these systems also operate on the cellular uh, networks too. So before when older radio systems were kind of limited to where you could go, now you're just kind of limited by cellular connectivity. And that's gotten pretty broad and, and wide these days. So you can actually you know, talk to your drivers really all over the world if you need to. Uh, increased communication can always identify and help solve problems. You want everything to be as hands-free as, as much as possible. Uh, a lot of these systems can be connected to a Bluetooth headset too. So, you know, a driver could put on a Bluetooth headset, the same one that they use to talk to people on. They can actually use these PTT systems to communicate with dispatch so that they're not fumbling around with their cell phone. Uh, so that brings us to in-vehicle camera systems. And I always recommend using one that has a lens that faces inside the vehicle and a lens that faces outside the vehicle and includes some type of dr driver behavior analytic analytics. Um, a lot of people use camera systems, they can be used in a lot of different ways, right? So sometimes they're just used to kind of see what happens when there is an incident. So maybe there is an accident or there is a driver dispute or something like that. Sometimes you can bring the car in and you can offload the video and kind of look at it there. Uh, but a lot of the systems you see these days uh, can, you know, not only do they offer you a look at what happened, but they can show you events, right? So if a driver slams on their brakes, takes a turn too hard, speeding, um, some of the more advanced systems can now can tell you whether a driver is distracted or not. It can tell you if they're tailgating another vehicle. Uh, it can really tell you a lot about what's going on. So now you basically have a little piece of artificial intelligence in the vehicle that's analyzing the driver and the scene and what's happening all the time. And it can provide feedback to you and it can score drivers on their driving. So you can look and see, okay, I got drivers with good scores, I got drivers with bad scores. And it can give you information on how they drive. And this is, becomes really key because if you pay attention to that information and you can work with drivers and coach them to become better drivers, then you're going to have a safer driver and you have a safer fleet and you have safer passengers and everybody's going to be safer involved. And if for whatever reason that it's not happening, that's a good time to let that driver go because it allows you to prevent an incident before it really happens. Uh, so in-vehicle cameras can be a huge help in really preventing an issue, uh, not only just showing you what happens when there was an issue. Uh, it's always a good idea to make it well known that the camera is there, right? So really just putting that camera up in the windshield and making sure people can see it's great. Uh, a lot of times when people get in the car and they know that there's a camera there and they're, that there's another eye potentially watching them, then they're less likely to cause problems or they're less likely to give the driver a hard time because they know that might be recorded and that could be used against them. So, you know, don't hide the camera, make sure it's there. Make sure you have decals on the side of the vehicle that says, hey, there, you know, this, this vehicle uh, has an onboard camera and it may be recording all the time and you could be observed at any point in time. And again, you're letting them know what's exactly what's happening there. So in-vehicle cameras can be a huge help with all those things. So maintenance software. So maintenance software can be, again, 
this is very important because you're putting people behind the wheels of vehicles that are out there all the time. And those vehicles need to be in great shape. They need to make sure that they're, everything is in tip top shape with them. Uh, oil changes are on time. The tires are in good shape. You want those cars as, you know, as safe as you possibly can get them. So do the drivers and so do the passengers, right? And sometimes that can be very hard to keep up on. You've got a lot of moving parts, especially the bigger maybe your organization is, the more vehicles you have, the more drivers you have. This can become a little difficult to track and make sure everything's happening the way it should be. So some, some of the newer maintenance softwares are a huge help there because they're cloud-based, right? And we talked a little bit about Central Portal earlier where everybody can go and maintenance software becomes that portal for keeping up on your, on your vehicles. And so your mechanics can use it to, you know, make sure that everything that they're doing to a vehicle is logged. So when they rotate tires or change tires or do an oil change, that can be logged in the software. It knows what data was done, what time it was done, what the mileage on the vehicle is, and when is it due again? So it can remind you when that vehicle is due for maintenance very quickly because it can kind of keep track of the mileage of that vehicle over time. And that can be done by drivers manually entering the mileage when they do their checkoff sheet, or it can be done with a vehicle's OBD2 diagnostic port. Um, you can kind of pull some information from it to keep up on that mileage. And that allows you, again, to make sure your fleet is maintained very well. And the better your fleet is, the safer your fleet is. It also lets those drivers do those vehicle inspections uh, electronically now. So, you know, like us and probably many other people for a long time, that was all kind of done on pen and paper. And when you make it electronic, it makes it a little bit easier. Again, a driver doesn't necessarily always have to get a paper form. They're going to fill it out. They're going to hand it to somebody else. There's going to be a time period between that person probably hands it to a manager and that manager probably hands it to a garage staff. And so a lot of time and um, placement for error could happen within that time frame. By making it electronic, that kind of goes away a little bit. So a driver you know, pulls out their tablet or their cell phone or uses the one that's you know, in the vehicle, and they can do a pre-shift uh, pre inspection right there on the tablet. And they put in the mileage, everything that's going on with the vehicle. And if there's a problem with the vehicle, it'll alert your mechanic staff immediately or whoever needs to know immediately. Huge help right there. And it can also keep track, again, over time when that vehicle needs its maintenance and things like that. And it will, it will go a long way into making your fleet last longer and the, the, everything about that vehicle all safer as well. So newer vehicle systems and you know, everybody kind of talks about autonomous vehicles and we're probably still a really long way away from having lots of autonomous vehicles out there. You'll see projects here and there, but it's, we're still a while away. But what's really cool about it is we're seeing the trickle down technology of it. Backup cameras, uh, audio alerts, automated braking, right? Vehicles can kind of sense if uh, you're about to have an accident or something that, and the car itself can brake on its own. Uh, it can tell if you're, again, distracted, dri distracted driving or if you're lane weaving. You know, some of the newer vehicle systems can tell these things and can notify uh, you back at the office. And a lot of times that technology is built into the cameras like we discussed earlier. Um, there's also a company out there called Mobileye and they can put a little system like this in your vehicle. So you don't need to have the newest car out there. It's, you can actually retrofit some of these vehicles with some of this technology um, so that it can do some of these things as well. But I think this will help go a long way in reducing accidents in the future uh, because you'll have the technology that's assisting all this stuff. So if it thinks you're getting too close to another car, again, it can slow the vehicle down or bring it to a stop so you do not rear end somebody else. This means it's kind of preventing robberies. So this really happened. We don't see so much of this uh, now, and we'll go into to the reasons why. But there's still a lot of businesses out there that are cash-based businesses, and uh, the taxi business is kind of one of those. So if your transportation operation is running a taxi business and there's a lot of cash on hand, then uh, there's some ways you can kind of prevent having uh, any type of robbery or any type of issue like that. There's actually cash lock boxes you can buy to put the vehicles, and it's a little lock box. You lock it up, the key's not kept with the driver or not with the car, and they can just drop cash in there, and that will help keep the driver maybe safer that way. Um, a lot of times drivers can just kind of choose where they put their cash, right? They can maybe put it in a couple different places in the car. We always recommend, you know, having change up front really to the closest you can reach to. So somebody hands you a 20 and you need to give them a couple of dollars of change, you have easy access to that. 
uh, drivers can go through uh, the bank, right? You can always just go through the drive through If they have an account, they can drop off any cash at that point in time. Uh, partitions can play a big role in helping this. So you can partition. regardless of the time and things of that nature, but if it's used properly, that keeps people from kind of coming over the seat and getting to a driver. Uh, electronic payment systems can help a lot, right? And I think that's probably one of the biggest areas where we don't see so much robberies anymore is because in all honesty, there's less cash in most vehicles now. Uh, between credit cards and um, account business, you don't have so much cash in, 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 on hand. And I think that goes a long way to help uh, you know, rob robbers from prevented. If you're not a target because you don't have cash, then what is it to take? Again, always making sure that, that the drivers wear themselves passengers in the environment. So where you're picking somebody up, where you're taking them, is it nighttime, is it daytime? Uh, how many people are involved? You know, always pay attention to cues and details are, are great ways for drivers to figure out if they're about to be in a bad situation or not. And then using your communication skills to de-escalate a situation. So if you're getting a hard time by passengers and they kind of want you to go down some, you know, it's nighttime, they want you to go to some different alleys, you know, being able to use your, your communication skills or having a camera on hand uh, kind of gets you out of that scenario. So talk to, I mentioned this earlier, electronic and contactless payment systems. This can go a long way with keeping cash out of the vehicle. And again, the less cash you have, the less target you are for a robbery or something like that. And so, and this gift, this is built into a lot of dispatch systems. They have so many different ways of taking payments now that it makes it a lot easier to do it. Uh, obviously the most common way is credit cards and credit cards can be, you know, typed into a terminal, but these days really the chip is, is kind of the most important thing on the credit card to make sure that the uh, transaction is secure and safe. And so I always recommend trying to have some type of credit card reader in the vehicle. And it could be, you know, a square reader, it could be somebody your dispatch vendor works with, uh, things of that nature, but that, it's, that technology has become a lot more cheap and cheaper and easier to implement these days. So it's a great way to kind of uh, keep cash out of the car. Venmo, PayPal, Cash App, these are all kind of plug words that you've heard of the last couple of years that are out there and that take electronic payments without a card. So you don't even need a credit card anymore, right? You can, you can do it through PayPal or Cash App or, or Zelle. Uh, Zelle is something that all major banks utilize really. So if you have a, a bank account, you probably have Zelle. And all you have to do is kind of, you know, activate it on your account. And then you can transfer money from somebody to uh, anybody else via an email address and or phone number. And it's pretty much instant. Um, and then I think in the future, there's going to be uh, cases for cryptocurrency. So that's, we're still very young in that area, but, you know, blockchain technology has been progressing over the years. And it's, you know, I think it's going to get to the point where it does become very secure, very safe, and very fast. We're not there yet, uh, but that'll make it easier to do all kinds of things. Not only just take electronic payments, but that'll probably be a backbone for dispatching technology and, and things like that. Germs, viruses, and bacteria. So obviously we've gone through a pandemic over the last year and a half. And you know, we went through a time period where some companies had to shut down or we had to figure out ways to deal with a, uh, a germ or virus that we weren't used to. And the CDC issued a, a bunch of guidelines and some of them included, you know, don't use recirculated air, use fresh air, roll the windows down, avoid handing out anything such as water bottles, magazines. You don't want to, to touch multiple things at the same time. Clean and disinfect the vehicle, especially the high touch places, right? So door handles, uh, steering wheels, back seats, all that stuff. Uh, frequently, the driver's always washing their hands, soap 20 seconds or longer. Uh, if you don't have that, use um, some type of hand sanitizer that's about 60% or higher alcohol-based solution. Um, and then obviously, you know, limit contact as much as you possibly can, put as much distance between you and, and somebody else. Uh, one of the things that we kind of came across when we were dealing with all this was a substance called Permasafe. And Permasafe, what it does is it creates a uh, electromechanical surface uh, on a molecular level. So when you spray it onto the car, there's, it's a two-phase program. Phase one disinfects everything. And then phase two creates a, um, a, a layer that will actually kill viruses indefinitely. So as long as that surface stays intact on that vehicle or inside that vehicle, it continues to kind of kill viruses and such. And when I say surface intact, you're not just gonna wipe it off with your hand, 
but if you were to scrape the surface of the seat or something like that, it would remove it. But other than that, this is something you can spray inside the vehicle. Um, it's FDA, EPA, all that stuff. It's one of the uh, more safer things that we found that was out there. And I like the fact that it just continuously does its job, right? So you could probably maybe treat the interior of a car uh, once a year and it will continue to kill viruses and things of that nature into the future. Um, so for the most part, uh, that's the end of this presentation. Uh, I appreciate everybody attending and we'll open it up to questions. So I'm gonna hand it back over to you, Amanda. Yeah, thanks, Jeb. That was awesome. Really appreciate it. Um, a couple questions, but first I wanna just mention one thing. You talked about defensive driving um, in your presentation. And I wanna remind everyone for the Massachusetts drivers as well as Massachusetts taxi and livery companies that we have scholarships available uh, that you can apply for on our ridelocalma.com website that um, can cover things like a defensive driving course that's offered through the National Safety Council. So uh, you can, again, find that information at ridelocalma.com. So thanks for bringing that back. That, that, important issue up. Um, so one question um, you talked about um, the Permasafe is, are there any other good products that you'd recommend that you've found over the past year and a half that might help with some vehicle sanitation? Yeah, so we, we did, we, we did all kinds of uh, research when we were looking into this and you do have to kind of be careful. So uh, one of the things we came across was uh, Oza. Right? Ozone is actually very good at killing viruses and things like that, but it's not really the greatest for people. So you don't want anything that creates ozone all the time, but you could actually buy a little machine. So if you had a car that you really wanted to desanitize, you can buy machines where you just put them in the car, you roll up the windows, you close the doors, you walk away, you give it about 15 minutes and the ozone kills the stuff. Take the machine out, roll the windows down, let it air out for a second, and that can be a good way to disinfect things. Uh, UVC lamps are also very good. A lot of hospitals use stuff like that. And that's a lamp that you can kind of wave over a certain part of the car or area. Or again, you can buy devices that produce that light for a period of time, put it in the car, close up the doors, things like that. But you, you don't want people exposed to that for a very long period of time either. So you don't want to, you don't want to have a UVC lamp on in the car all the time. Um, there was another thing called aqueous ozone. And aqueous ozone can take your regular tap water and it can turn into what they call aqueous ozone. It's almost like oxyclean to a certain degree. And for about 24 hours, that uh, water then is energized to kill viruses and bacteria. Again, it's super safe. It makes it great. You put it in a spray bottle. If you need to clean something up at that time, it works very well. Another good thing about um, that product is that it's a machine. It's not a cheap machine. It runs about $1,500. Uh, but it allows you to produce tons of stuff. So when we were going through the pandemic, right, you were running out of supplies. It was very difficult to find uh, normal sanitizers and things like that. So if you had one of these machines, you can make it on demand just by using your tap water. And it, and it was pretty effective and safe. So those are some few ideas there that can help, uh, help with your sanitization, keep things clean. That's great. Along the same lines, um, it, in your operations, wondering if you can talk through what safety protocols you might keep in place as we're coming out of the pandemic that you might have started to implement during the pandemic. Um, you know, are you going to recommend going back to handing out water bottles or mints or, uh, you know, and will you still regularly recommend disinfecting, you know, vehicles the way we did during the pandemic? Yeah. So, you know, Amanda, when you watch, you ever watch like a sci-fi movie or something like that and Love might them. Be, yeah exactly right. so there's always like a scene in it where somebody releases something right and it goes to the hvac system and it gets spread out and it lands on somebody's hands and that person grabs a doorknob and somebody else grabs that doorknob and they eat a sandwich right so this is what i think of all the time now that constantly goes through my head and so i'm i'm highly aware of that everywhere and no matter what going forward whether it's a virus or not if you put that thought process through your head throughout the day on everything you touch or see, you're going to want to wash your hands all the time. You're going to want to sanitize your hands all the time. You're going to do these things all the time. And some people may argue, hey, that's one of the reasons why we have good immune systems is because, you know, you do have a little um, interaction with some germs out there. So you got to find your, your balance. 
but ultimately, yeah, I think overall in operation, I think we are going to be more aware of that stuff. We uh, are going to use the permasafe in our vehicles to kind of keep that going and keeping the vehicles going. Because when you think, when you take that example I just gave you and then add vehicles on top of it, right? They're going to airports, they're going to train stations, they're going to bus stations. The amount of crazy germs that are going through all this stuff, it's out there all the time. So I think there's a lot of things. I don't think it needs to be uh, as far as when it was in the height of the pandemic, but it doesn't hurt to wash your hands more often. It's not gonna hurt to maybe keep some hand sanitizer there. It's not gonna hurt to you know, maybe fog down the car every once in a while. So yeah, I, I think there's some practices that uh, we'll probably keep in place and I recommend other people do as well. That's great, thanks, Jeb. Um, I have another question here. Uh, in our small operation, which is about 10 cars, uh, do I need to hire a new person whose sole job is just to analyze the data coming from some of these cameras or equipment, or do these technologies do all the analysis and then kind of just flag it when there's something I need to pay attention to? So there is a huge mix of all kinds of options out there. Um, we've been doing this since 2003. Back in 2003, you put the camera in your car. When it came into the lot, you had to plug a USB cable into it. It put the data to a computer, and we did have a person who watched every event. Now, an event was just a time frame, right? It wasn't continuous video. They weren't watching just 24-7 video. They would watch a triggered event based on a driving action. And in the beginning, that becomes a little overwhelming because you're not used to it. You're going through all these events. Now, over time, if you're doing a good job of coaching drivers to prevent those events from happening, it becomes very manageable. It's really not that bad. An operation runs about 25 vehicles. And we were able to do it with just our general manager who was already doing other things. We just added that task to their plate. So as long as you can kind of get it to that point where it's finite and you've got it detailed out, it's not so bad. Now, on the flip side mm -hmm. of that, the newer technology out there does do a lot of this stuff for you. Some of the camera systems have facial recognition, so they know that Jeb Corey is driving your car, so you don't actually have to create a link between Jeb Corey and that event anymore. It knows Jeb Corey is in this car and this is how he's driving and it does the management of that data for you and you just kind of review reports. Now, as I said earlier, this is all balance though and that technology costs more money. So you have to find what's right for balance for your operation and where you can spend time or money going over the data. Um, but it, it is super useful. I mean, we, there's, we use the camera systems all the time and it's, it's a huge safety, huge safety thing for drivers. That's great, thank you. Um, another question here, how do you train your drivers to deal with unruly passengers? <laughs> we kind of talked about this, but yeah, yeah. And, you know, one of the great ways that we do it is, is, is kind of going over certain scenarios, right? If you can do some role playing, that's fantastic. I know sometimes, again, people get really busy, especially in small businesses who don't have somebody who's dedicated to this type of thing. So it can take a lot of time to do that role playing. So what we will do also is, again, using that in-vehicle uh, camera technology we have, if we've captured issues, right, where you have an unruly passenger and you need to resolve an issue. If that happened in real life and we have it on camera, we use that as a training tool. So that can be something that you include a link to every once in a while in a text message. Hey, this is how you handle this scenario. Send out that and have a link to the video and they can watch it when they can. So as many times as often, if you can do things in real time with people, I always prefer that. If you can't though, use examples or create your own little video thing. If you don't have in-vehicle cameras and you didn't capture it in real life, if you act through it once, right? If you just make a recording of the video yourself, you can then have that to show to other people. That's great. I like the idea of using those as training videos. That's, 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 that's great. It's a huge <laughs> Because you real world you, example. <laughs> right. And even as a transportation owner, for years we didn't really have, I mean, you kind of know what's going on in your vehicles, but really until you see it all the time, now all of a sudden you really do know what's going on in your vehicles. And it brings a lot of things to light that you didn't know before or weren't prepared for. And you can use that information to create great training scenarios to keep drivers, passengers, and the general public safe. Yeah. That's so smart. Um, so if as a smaller business or even as a bigger one, but I have a limited budget for the foreseeable future, 
what would you what do you think is the best uh, return on investment when it comes to safety technology? If I had to prioritize where to spend my funds? Yeah, I, I think two places really there: dispatch systems and both in vehicle camera systems. Those are you know they can be expensive, but they are much cheaper now than they ever have been before. And like all technology, the cost is getting cheaper, and the feature value proposition of it is getting higher. So I always recommend those two things, especially with the camera system, because it, it does provide so many different aspects. It's not just taking a, a snapshot of an event that's happening at that time. You can use it to coach drivers to prevent issues from happening. You can use it to you know, see what's happening in real time, and you can use it as, again, as training examples of what's happening uh, you know, throughout your operation. So I, I just can't really talk highly enough about that technology. We've been using it for almost 20 years, and it, all it takes is it, um, saving you from one accident, it'll cover itself in no problem. That's great. Um, so this one's um, maybe something new, maybe something old, maybe you've seen it in the pandemic, but is there um, any new safety situations that completely have caught you or some of your drivers unaware um, and uh, how how did you guys recover from that? And you know, did you have to make any longer term changes to address that new yeah. issue that came up? Yeah, that is a good question. I mean, definitely the pandemic, well, obviously, I think for everybody was uh, something relatively new. Most people I know of did not have not lived through this before. And uh, I think one good thing that we did, and uh, any, I think. The best way to say this is when you have come across something that you are not familiar with, have never dealt with before, two things you want to do is educate yourself on it as much as you possibly can and research as many solutions as you can and then implement and learn from that implementation and move forward. So that's what we did with the pandemic, right? This came in, everybody was shocked, nobody knew what was going on. We researched it, we looked at all the different things we could implement. We purchased as much stuff as we possibly could. We learned from what was out there. We improved our cycle. And you just got to kind of stay on top of that. Um, one thing that, you know, you, again, you said something old, something new, something that used to happen a long time ago, and I just read an article the other day that started to happen again, is that um, people uh, are, are, they're staging accidents, right? They're identifying uh, taxi companies, uh, bus companies, uh, big trucking companies that they see on the road and they're sophisticated, right? They're, it's not just one person trying to get himself into an accident. They're identifying a bad intersection. I kind of talked about that earlier, right? Bad intersections in town where accidents may happen all the time. And so they've identified a place. They may set up two or three drivers to be part of the incident. And they may set up a witness somewhere as well, right? So they're setting up this whole scenario and they're causing a traffic accident so they can try to make a claim against the, you know, the company's insurance for money and things like that. Uh, and again, that used to happen a lot. And I just read an article that people, that's becoming more sophisticated. It's a more sophisticated scam. And that kind of comes back to that training earlier what I was talking about is being aware, right? If you are self-aware, if you're aware of what's going on in your surroundings, if you're aware of what's happening with your passenger, you can reduce the risk of something like that happening. If you're using in-vehicle camera technology that can also pay attention to that too, that may be able to get you out of one of these scams easy. That's great, thank you. Um, so I think this will be our last question before we wrap it up. You kind of just talked about this of people putting your drivers in these situations that might result in something bad. But when you get, uh, for example, a complaint that might come into your general line, do you have policies and procedures in place for how you review that complaint and then uh, you know it, how to, um, address those safety concerns moving forward? Yeah, most certainly. So, you know, right off the bat, again, like I mentioned earlier, identify the problem is. So you get the complaint in, obviously you need to know when and where it happened, right? And then check your resources. So if you're using one of the electronic dispatch systems, you can validate, was that passenger in the car at the time? Was that car in the place where they said it was happening? Go back to your camera system. Sometimes you can pull footage. Like our camera system allows us to pull footage even after, if it's not an event, right? We have a time period where we can pull footage from it. So information, uh, like everything, is key these days. 
So you can get a complaint. And if the more information you have to resolve that problem, the better off you are. You can go back to your phone records. You can go back to your dispatch system. You can go back to the camera system, pull all that data together and review it. If it shows that the passenger's in the wrong, okay, then you can kind of validate your driver didn't do such a bad job. You can still apologize to the passenger, tell them that you're gonna get the driver and hope that it never happens again. If your passenger or if your driver is in the wrong, you wanna know about that, right? And that becomes a good coaching tool. And maybe it was just a misunderstanding, but if you can go back and look at all that data, you can see, okay, this is what happened. It was a misunderstanding or a miscommunication or, okay, this really was a problem. I know you had a tough day. And then you can kind of go back over what we talked about earlier with the role playing. This is how you should have handled the situation and why. This would have de-escalated the area. So arm yourself with as much information as you possibly can and be prepared to act on it quickly. Awesome. Thanks, Jeb. Well, thank you so much for today's presentation. This was very insightful and I hope that everyone found it, um, helped, found some helpful tidbits. So thank you for putting this on. Thanks for having um, me. Yeah, and I'd like to just remind folks, you can access today's webinar and any of our previous webinars on the Ride Local Massachusetts website, which is ridelocalma.com. Uh, these will be on there as well as a variety of other resources. And again, you can also access the application to apply for the scholarships uh, as well. Um, so I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you again, Jeb, for putting this presentation on. And uh, we will be in touch about uh, future uh, webinar events. Thanks, everyone.